Presidential elections can get hazy with time. So for this video, I'll briefly be going over every election from 1789 through 1864. I will not be going into my own personal opinion on the candidates because I don't want to piss off half the people who watch or get a commenter historian mad at me. I will also not be going into crazy in-depth details about the ebbs and flows of the campaigns. It's kind of boring to go into too much detail about an election that's a landslide. Instead, I'll focus more on the closer slash pivotal elections and what issues or states decided them. This video is purely meant to give you a quick background on who won what presidential election and what were the the major issues at the time. George Washington versus pretty much nobody. So background to understand how the first presidential election came about, under the Articles of Confederation, which were ratified in 1781, the United States had no head of state, meaning executive power was pretty limited. But with the creation of the Constitution came the offices of the President and the Vice President, fully separating these offices from Congress. The Constitution established an electoral college based on each state's congressional representation in which each elector would cast two votes for the candidates, which effectively doubled the vote. The electors were supposed to cast one vote for who they believed should be president and one vote for who they believed to be vice president. And at the end of the election, whoever had the most votes would become president. And whoever had the second most amount of votes would become vice president. Pretty simple, right? George Washington was easily the most popular man in the country after winning the Revolutionary War. All 69 electors present cast one vote for Washington, making him the unanimous selection for president. John Adams won 34 electoral votes and the vice presidency. The remaining 35 electoral votes were split among 10 candidates, including John Jay. Three states were ineligible to participate in the election. New York's legislature did not choose electors on time, and North Carolina and Rhode Island had not ratified the Constitution yet. Also, Maine was a part of Massachusetts until 1820 when it became a state. The election of 1792. Washington again versus nobody. The second presidential election in U.S. history was the first in which each of the original 13 states appointed electors, in addition to newly added states of Kentucky and Vermont. It was also the only presidential election that was not held four years after the previous election. Washington was so immensely popular, there was another candidate who had a hope of replacing him. That doesn't mean there weren't issues, though. One of the biggest issues of the day was the Militia Act of 1792, which gave the president the ability to take over the state militia in times of imminent invasion or insurrection. Oh, and fun fact, Virginia's 21 electoral votes represented 15.9% of the total, which is the single greatest concentration for one state in U.S. history. The election of 1796, John Adams vs. Thomas Jefferson. Finally, a real election. Also, Thomas Pickney and Aaron Burr got some electoral votes, but that had more to do with the system at the time, where each elector got two votes. This was the first contested American presidential election, and the only one to elect a president and a vice president from opposing tickets. After George Washington refused a third term in office, it came down between Vice President John Adams of Massachusetts on the Federalist ticket and former Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson of Virginia on the Democratic-Republican ticket. The debate essentially boiled down to what would the future path of the U.S. be. The Federalists, i.e. Hamiltonians, wanted a stronger central government and were more pro-Britain, valuing common language, ancestry, and trading foundation with them. The Democratic Republicans, i.e. Jeffersonians, were for more limited government and for stronger states. They were also more anti-British and pro-France due to French help during the revolution and common ideological connection to the anti-monarchist feeling of the French Revolution. John Adams won, but he won barely, with 71 electoral votes to Thomas Jefferson's 68. The key states were North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Democratic Republicans won them, but one elector in each state cast a vote for the Federalist Adams. If two of those three electoral votes were put to the TJ column, he would have won. Jefferson did receive the second most electoral votes and was elected vice president, which is kind of weird. The election of 1800, Thomas Jefferson vs. John Adams, round two. This election is sometimes referred to as the Revolution of 1800. Vice President Thomas Jefferson ran against incumbent President John Adams, which is, once again, still weird. The election was a realigning election that ushered in a generation of Republican rule, or Democratic Republican rule, or modern day Democrats. It's a lot. This election also ultimately led to the demise of the Federalist Party. It was a lengthy and bitter rematch with a lot of the same issues as the 1796 election. Some of the key issues at the time included opposition to the tax imposed by Congress to pay for the mobilization of a new army and navy for the quasi-war against France in 1798, and the Alien and Sedation Acts, which Federalists were using to try to stifle some dissent. While Republicans were organized at the state and local levels, the Federalists were disorganized and suffered a bitter split between their two major leaders, President Adams and Alexander Hamilton. The jockeying for electoral votes, regional divisions, and propaganda smear campaigns created by both parties made the election pretty modern by our standards. Thomas Jefferson won by a pretty tight margin of 73 to 65. The key states were PA, North Carolina, and Maryland. 
each one of those states split their votes, and if they had shifted a little bit in that split, then Adams could have won the day. Things didn't exactly end there. This is where it gets really weird. The Democratic-Republican plan to give Thomas Jefferson one more vote than fellow Democratic-Republican Aaron Burr went to shit, and they both ended up with 73 votes. Now, under the rules of the Constitution, the outgoing House of Representatives had to choose between Jefferson and Burr. For this vote, each state delegation got to cast one vote. And in order for a candidate to win, he had to win a majority of the states. Neither Burr nor Jefferson were able to win on the first 35 ballots, as most Federalist representatives backed Burr, and all the Democratic-Republican representatives backed Jefferson. Hamilton favored Jefferson over Burr, and he convinced several Federalists to switch their support to Jefferson, which then gave Jefferson the victory on the 36th ballot. This controversy eventually led to the passage of the 12th Amendment, which changed the electoral voting process to require each member of the Electoral College to cast one vote for president and one vote for vice president. The election of 1804, Thomas Jefferson versus Charles Pickney. This was the first election where electors were required to specify in their votes their choice for president and vice president. In this election, Thomas Jefferson easily crushed Pickney. Unfortunately for the Federalist Party, their most well-known candidate, Alexander Hamilton, died of a duel in July of 1804. Jefferson's 45 percentage point victory margin remains the highest victory margin in a presidential election, in which there were multiple major party candidates. The election of 1808, James Madison versus Charles Pickney. Madison had served as Under Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson, and Pickney had just lost the previous presidential election, which showed you how far the Federalist Party had fallen. Sitting Vice President George Clinton, who had served under Thomas Jefferson, was also a candidate for president, and garnered six electoral votes from a wing of the Democratic-Republican Party that disapproved of James Madison. This election was never really in doubt, and the Democratic-Republicans easily carried the day. The election of 1812, James Madison vs. DeWitt Clinton. This was the first presidential election that took place during a war, the War of 1812. It featured an intriguing competition between the incumbent Democratic-Republican President James Madison and a dissident Democratic-Republican DeWitt Clinton, nephew of Madison's late vice president. The Federalist opposition threw their support behind Clinton, which shows you how little options they had. It didn't really matter though, Madison was easily re-elected. The election of 1816, James Monroe versus Rufus King. Yeah, we're really getting to the bottom of the barrel of the Federalist Party. At this point, they were in full collapse. Prominent members of the party had been vocally anti-war in 1812, and there were even rumors that the New England area, which was a Federalist stronghold, was trying to secede and have their own separate peace with Great Britain. In 1815, at the end of the war, Andrew Jackson's great victory at the Battle of New Orleans raised the feeling of victory, and it drenched everyone who had opposed the war in the stench of treason. Furthermore, President Madison had adopted Federalist policies like a national bank and protective tariffs, so it really took away a lot that the Federalists usually ran on. James Monroe, who was Madison's Secretary of State, was easily able to overcome that divided Federalist opposition and won the Electoral College by a very wide margin of 183 to 34. The election of 1820, James Monroe versus Nobody. This was the third and last presidential election in U.S. history in which a candidate effectively ran unopposed. The other two were the Washington ones. Incumbent President James Monroe and Vice President Daniel Tompkins were re-elected without a real serious campaign. Despite the continuation of single-party politics, known in this case as the era of good feelings, fun name I know, right? Serious issues emerged during the election in 1820. The nation had endured a widespread depression following the Panic of 1819, and the momentous issue of extension of slavery into the territories was taking center stage. Nonetheless, James Monroe faced no opposition, so he won handily. John Quincy Adams did steal a whole one electoral vote from him, though. The election of 1824. Let's get a little weird. John Quincy Adams versus Andrew Jackson, but also William Crawford and Henry Clay were important factors in the electoral outcome. By this election, the Federalist Party had dissolved. The Democratic-Republican Party splintered into four separate candidates for the presidency. Such splintering had not yet led to formal party organization, but later the faction led by Andrew Jackson would evolve into the Democratic Party, while factions led by John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay would become the National Republican Party, and then later the Whig Party. Under the rules of the Constitution, the candidate who receives the majority, or over half the electoral votes, wins. That is where this election gets fun to look at. At the end of the vote, Andrew Jackson had a plurality. So more votes than anybody else, but not an absolute majority, or over half. That threw the election into the House of Representatives, which John Quincy Adams won on the first ballot, and ultimately made Jackson feel as if the election was stolen from him. This was the end of the Republican Federalist political framework. The electoral map confirmed the candidate's sectional support. Adams won in New England, Jackson having more broad voter appeal, Clay attracting votes out west, and Crawford attracting votes from the eastern south. 
Jackson's electoral college plurality was a result of the three-fifths compromise. The electoral college results would have been 83 for Adams and 77 for Jackson without the inflated electoral count of slaveholding states. Crawford likewise benefited in this regard, as but all of eight of his electoral votes were from slave states. The issue of slavery and election was just getting started, and would have a much more featured role in elections to come. The election of 1828, John Quincy Adams versus Andrew Jackson, the rematch. This rematch saw incumbent Vice President John C. Calhoun side with the Jacksonians, now named the Democratic Party, while Adams led the newly formed National Republicans. Unlike the 1824 election, no other major candidates appeared in the race, allowing Jackson to consolidate a power base and easily win an electoral victory over Adams, who really only had support in the Atlantic Northeast. The Democratic Party drew support from Jackson's existing power base while adding the old Republicans to their coalition. The election of 1832, Andrew Jackson versus Henry Clay, and also William Wirt of the Anti-Masonic Party. I hope I pronounced that properly. Jackson was easily able to win re-election against Henry Clay of Kentucky. He won 219 of the 286 electoral votes cast. John Floyd, who was not an actual candidate, did receive the electoral votes of South Carolina. This was the first national election for Martin Van Buren of New York, who was put on the ticket to succeed John C. Calhoun as VP. Van Buren faced opposition for the vice presidency within his own party, and as a result, all 30 Pennsylvania electors cast ballots for native son William Wilkins. The election of 1836, Martin Van Buren versus the Whigs, but mainly William Henry Harrison. The election of 1836 is predominantly remembered for three reasons. Number one, it was the last election until 1988 to result in the incumbent vice president moving up to the presidency by not having the current president die or resign. Number two, it was the only race in which a major political party intentionally ran several presidential candidates. The newly established Whig Party was formed by opposition to Andrew Jackson's policies and came up with a plan to run four different candidates in different regions of the country. The goal was that each would be popular enough in their respective regions to defeat Andrew Jackson's hand-picked successor, Martin Van Buren. This would prevent Van Buren from gaining a majority. Then the House of Representatives could decide between the competing Whig candidates. Most northern and border state Whigs supported the ticket led by William Henry Harrison, while most southern Whigs supported the ticket led by Hugh Lawson White. Two other Whigs, Daniel Webster and Willie Pearson Mangnum, carried Massachusetts and South Carolina respectively on their single state tickets. The strategy did fail and Van Buren won a majority of the electoral votes, but it came very close to success, as Van Buren won the decisive state of Pennsylvania by just two points, which, if denied to Van Buren, would have brought his electoral total down to 135, below the needed 148 to win. And number three, this election is the first, and to date only time, in which a vice presidential election was thrown into the Senate, as Virginia's electors voted for Van Buren but refused to vote for Johnson, his running mate. Johnson then fell one vote short of an electoral majority compelling a contingent election for vice president. In that contingent election, the United States Senate elected Johnson over Harrison's running mate, Francis Granger, on the first ballot. The election of 1840, Martin Van Buren versus William Henry Harrison. President Martin Van Buren was fighting for re-election against an economic depression in a Whig party which finally found its footing behind war hero William Henry Harrison, rallying under the slogan, Tippy Canoe and Tyler Two. Damn, that's a catchy title. The Whigs easily defeated Van Buren. This election was unique in that electors cast votes for four men who had been or would become president of the United States. There was obviously Martin Van Buren and William Henry Harrison, but there was also vice president-elect John Tyler, who would succeed Harrison upon his death, and James K. Polk, who received one electoral vote for vice president. William Henry Harrison has the distinction of the shortest presidential term, lasting only 31 days after inauguration. The common story is that he refused to wear a hat, gloves, or a coat for his speech in the freezing cold weather, then he got sick and died. Recent research finds it more likely that he drank contaminated drinking water because the sewage of Washington, D.C. was dumped in a marsh just seven blocks upstream from the White House's main water supply. And researchers have surmised that bacteria seeped into the drinking water and caused the president's fatal illness. Whether it was chilly weather or poop water, old Tippy Canoe made way for Tyler. The election of 1844, James K. Polk versus Henry Clay. This tight contest was ultimately decided by foreign policy, 
Democratic nominee James K. Polk ran on a platform that embraced American territorial expansionism, an idea soon to be called Manifest Destiny. At their convention, the Democrats called for the annexation of Texas and asserted that the United States had a clear and unquestionable claim to the whole of Oregon. By uniformly tying the Oregon boundary dispute to the more controversial Texas debate, the Democrats appealed to both Northern expansionists, who were more adamant about the Oregon boundary, and the Southern expansionists, who were more focused on annexing Texas as a slave state. Polk went on to win a narrow victory over Whig candidate Henry Clay, in part because Clay had taken a stance against expansion. This was also the last presidential election to be held on different days in different states. As starting with the presidential election of 1848, all states held the election on the same day in November. The election of 1848, Zachary Taylor vs. Lewis Cass. The US presidential election of 1848 was an open race. President James K. Polk promised before the 1844 general election he would seek only one term, which helped him take the Democratic nomination. Now achieving all of his major objectives in one term and suffering from declining health that would take his life only four months after leaving office, he kept his promise and did not seek re-election. The Whigs in 1846-47 had focused all their energies on condemning Polk's war policies. They had a quickly reversed course, learning from the Federalist mistake of condemning a victorious war. In February of 1848, Polk's treaty to end the Mexican-American War gave the U.S. vast new territories, including California, Nevada, Utah, parts of Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. The Whigs in the Senate voted 2-1 to one to approve the treaty. Then in the summer, the Whigs nominated war hero Zachary Taylor. While he did promise no more future wars, he did not condemn the war or criticize Polk, and Whigs had to follow his lead. They shifted their attention to the new issue of whether slavery could be banned from new territories. The choice of Taylor was almost in desperation. He was really not a committed Whig, but he was popular for leading the war effort. The Democrats had a record of victory, peace, prosperity, and the acquisition of Oregon in the Southwest. They appeared almost certain to win, unless the Whigs picked somebody really popular. Taylor's victory made him one of only two Whigs to be elected president before the party ceased to exist in the 1850s. The other Whig to be elected president was William Henry Harrison, who also had been a general and a war hero. Moral of the story, Whigs should have nominated more war heroes. The election of 1852, Franklin Pierce versus Winfield Scott. So this election needs a little background stage setting. Zachary Taylor had died in office in 1850, which led to Millard Fillmore taking over. When Fillmore was president, he endorsed the Compromise of 1850 and enforced the Fugitive Slave Law. This did earn Fillmore Southern voter support, but also compromised his Northern standing, which made him a very divisive candidate for the Whig National Convention. On the 53rd ballot, Winfield Scott finally defeated Fillmore for the nomination. Scott strained Whig party unity as his anti-slavery reputation gravely damaged his campaign in the South. Franklin Pierce of New Hampshire, as a Northern Democrat, did not have the polarizing effect of Scott, so he won a comfortable popular majority, carrying 27 of the 31 states. The Whig party strategy of nominating generals who were war heroes had finally failed. After the 1852 election, the Whig party, already divided, quickly collapsed. The members of the declining party failed to nominate a candidate for the next presidential race. It was soon replaced as a Democratic Party's primary opposition by the new Republican Party. The election of 1856, James Buchanan vs. John C. Fremont. With the usual side parties causing havoc, this election was when the slavery issue really got heated during campaign season. With the disintegration of the Whig Party over slavery, the newly formed Republican Party took center stage. Candidate John C. Fremont condemned the Kansas-Nebraska Act and crusaded against slave power and the expansion of slavery, while Democrat James Buchanan warned that the Republicans were extremists whose victory would lead to civil war. The Democrats endorsed the moderate popular sovereignty approach to slavery expansion utilized in the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Former President Millard Fillmore joined a third party, the relatively new American Party, or the Know Nothings. The Know Nothings, who ignored the slavery issue in favor of anti-immigration policies, won a little over the fifth of the vote. The incumbent president, Franklin Pierce, was defeated in his effort to be renominated by the Democrats. Their official party slogan that year was Anybody But Pierce, who instead selected James Buchanan of Pennsylvania. This was thanks in part to the fact that the Kansas-Nebraska Act had divided Democrats. Buchanan won, receiving only about 45% of the popular vote, with key states being Pennsylvania and Maryland. When you look at the electoral map, Fremont's strongest support was the North. If the Democrats had nominated somebody not native to PA, and Fremont had been able to take it, as well as with the addition of Maryland from ex-Whig Fillmore, he would have won the election. The election of 1860, 
This was a four-way race between Abraham Lincoln, John C. Breckinridge, Stephen Davis, and John Bell. It also set the stage for the Civil War. The United States had become increasingly sectionally divided on the issue of slavery, its existence, as well as its possible expansion. The incumbent president, James Buchanan, like his predecessor, Franklin Pierce, was a Northern Democrat with Southern sympathies. But Buchanan had promised not to seek re-election, and he stuck by that promise. On the Republican side, during their national convention in Chicago, they nominated Abraham Lincoln, a moderate, former one-time Whig representative from Illinois. Its platform promised not to interfere with slavery in the South, but opposed the extension of slavery into territories. The Democratic National Convention, on the other hand, in Charleston, South Carolina, came to an end without agreeing on a nominee. But a second convention in Baltimore nominated Illinois Senator Stephen Douglas. Douglas's support for the concept of popular sovereignty, which called for each territory's settlers to decide locally on the issue of slavery, alienated many radical pro-slavery Southern Democrats, who wanted the territories and perhaps even other lands open to slavery. With James Buchanan's support, Southern Democrats held their own convention, nominating Vice President John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky. As well, the Constitutional Union Party made an appearance, and they nominated a ticket led by former Tennessee Senator John Bell. Lincoln's main opponent in the North was Douglas, who won the popular vote in two states, Missouri and New Jersey. Douglas was the only candidate in the 1860 election to win electoral votes in both free states and slave states. In the South, Bell won three states, and Breckinridge swept the remaining 11. The Lincoln ticket was absent from the ballot in 10 slave states won a national popular plurality, a popular majority in the North where states already had abolished slavery, and a national electoral majority comprising only Northern electoral votes. Even if the Southern Democrats had unified behind one candidate, Lincoln's command of key electoral states of Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania made it near impossible to overcome. The election motivated seven Southern states, all voting for Breckinridge, to secede before the inauguration in March. The American Civil War began less than two months after Lincoln's inauguration. The election of 1864, Abraham Lincoln versus George McClellan. This election obviously did not include the states who had already left the Union, and with the Civil War in full swing, it was basically a public opinion poll to either confirm Lincoln's policies of war with the South, as well as his Emancipation Proclamation, made in the fall of 1862. Northern Democrats were divided between Copperheads, who favored immediate peace with the Confederacy, and War Democrats, who supported the war. Their national convention ended up nominating McClellan, the former Army of the Potomac top general. McClellan was immensely popular with his troops when he took over the army, but fell out of favor with Lincoln after the Battle of Antietam, and his failure fully crushed Lee's army. They adopted a platform of advocating peace with the Confederacy, a platform that McClellan never formally endorsed. In the summer of 1864, the Democratic Peace Faction had strong optimism, but when General Sherman's army took Atlanta in the summer of 1864 and the end of the Confederacy was in sight, the peace movement lost all momentum, and Lincoln won handily. Lincoln won by over 400,000 popular votes and easily clinched an electoral majority. Several states allowed their citizens serving as soldiers in the field to cast ballots, a first in U.S. history. Soldiers in the army gave Lincoln more than 70% of their vote. This was the first election since the re-election of Andrew Jackson in 1832 that an incumbent president won re-election. Lincoln's second term was ended just six weeks after inauguration by an assassin, and the choice of Andrew Johnson as running mate suddenly loomed large for the future. You might be wondering why I stopped at 1864. I feel like those elections of 1789 through 1864 give you a good part one to US presidential history. In those years, the country was more of a collection of states or a union, and less so a true nation. Issues like how strong the central government should be, where US foreign policy should align itself, or slavery were bitter debates. Those heated debates eventually led to a civil war where over 600,000 soldiers died. But at the end of that came the birth of a nation. That nation was not without questions though, as key issues like reconstruction, racial equality, or how to best utilize the country's rising industrial might lay ahead for future presidential hopefuls to debate. I just hope at the end of the day that this video gave you some context into how these first presidents won their elections.